Nigijai, Namacharya, Shidahurida, Stapin, Jai, Rem, Say, Hosukashna, Chaitanya, Ravanichi, Way to get out, huh? She was to go, Rakta, Brinda Gijai, She, she, Radakushna, go, but go with a sign, Kun Radakunda, Giddy, go with a Kijai, Brinda, but a Kijai, Maturna Kijai. Jagat at the Sami Kajai, you would my Kajai, Shmat Blasa Devi Kajai. Some of Ada Bhakta, Vrinda Kajai, Go, Vrinda Dhani, all glorious, the assembled devotees. All glorious, the assembled devotees. All glorious, the assembled devotees. All glorious to Shi, Guru, and Gauranga, Shilpa Kijai. So today we are reading from the 8th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam, chapter 2, text 30. Thank you. Oh. Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Om Namo Bhagavate Vasudevaya Tato Kajendra Shah Mano Palo Jasam Kalena Virgena Mahan Abud Yayaha Rikshamana Shah Jale See the we pray you, Abut Sakalam Jalaukasaha, the Toga Jendra Shaman over Lauja Kalena de Gaina Mahana Budvaya. Shamana Shajaleva Sidato Vipaya Yobut Sakalamjala Kasaha Atatoka Jendra Shamana Ovalak Jasam Kalena Dear Gaina Mahana Budhyaha Shamana Shajaleva Sidato Vipariya Yogut Sakalamjala Kasaha The Toga Jendra Shamano Balauja Song Kalena Dear Gaina Mahana Bhutviyaha Shamana Shajaleva Sidato Vipariya Yobut Sakalam Jalakasaha
ladies. keep themselves fit, they must therefore place themselves in a normal condition of life. What constitutes a normal condition will not be the same for everyone, and therefore there are divisions of Varnashram, Ramana, Kshatriya, Purusha, Shudra, Brahmacharya, Prasta, Vanaprasta, and Sanyas. Especially in this age, Kali Yuga, it is advised that no one takes Sanyas. Ashramedam, Kapalam, Valam, 
Sanyasambala Aitrakam Adevarena Sutopatim Kalopancha Vivarjayet from this we can understand that's from the Brahma by Varta Purana. From this we can understand that in this age the sannyas dharma, ashram, sorry, is forbidden because people are not strong. Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu showed us an example in taking sannyas at the age of 24 years, but even Sarvabhoma Bhattacharya advised Sri Chaitanya Mahaprabhu to be extremely careful because he had taken sannyas at an early age. For preaching, we give young boys sannyas, but actually it has been experienced that they are not fit for sannyas. There is no harm, however, if one thinks that he is unfit for sannyas. If he is very much agitated sexually, he should go to the ashram where sex is allowed, namely Grahasta Ashram. That one has been found to be very weak in one place does not mean that he should stop fighting the crocodile of Maya. One should take shelter of the lotus feet of Krishna, as we shall see Gajendra do, and at the same time, one can be a grahasta if he is satisfied with sexual indulgence. There's no need to give up the fight. Sri Chitani Mahaprabhu therefore recommended stana istita shudikatam tanu vang anopi. One may stay in whichever ashram is suitable for him. It is not essential that one takes sannyas. If one is sexually agitated, he can enter the grahasta ashram. But one must continue fighting. For one who is not in a transcendental position to take sannyas artificially is not a very great credit. If sannyas is not suitable, one may enter the Rahastashram and fight Maya with great strength, but one should not give up the fighting and go away. Mm. So, Tato Gajendra Shamano Valkachasam Kalena Dirgena Mahanabud Viyaha Ave Krishavana Shajale Vasidato Vipario Bud Sakalam Jalo <coughs> so, I'm not going to specifically talk about the uh, aspect of sannyas in this uh, purport, the problem mentioned in the purport, but I'm going to be more general and talk about uh, people's uh, different needs. You know, everybody has different needs. Uh, we have physical needs, emotional needs, uh, mental needs, and of course, obviously, spiritual needs, social needs, I mean, all these different needs that we have uh, in this world. Now, we understand that we are not on the platform of the six Goswamis of Vrindavan, who were able to basically give up eating, give up sleeping, need jahara, vahara, which you tell is described by uh, Srinivas Acharya, that they gave up eating, or maybe they just took some, a pat of butter every uh, two days or something like that, or like Raghunath Das Goswami, you know, eating or sleeping, never didn't sleep, but resting like a half an hour every two days. I mean, we're not on that level. These personalities, they have spiritual bodies, uh, they are uh, Shaktavesh avatars, or uh, Shakta, uh, Shaktis of the Supreme, you know, many of them are gopis, they're not, many of them are not even jiva souls. Actually, many of the uh, great acharyas, they're actually incarnations of uh, Shakti tabla rather than jiva tabla. So, basically, uh, we cannot compare ourselves with these personalities. We uh, have to recognize that we have some needs according to our situation, as Prabhupada said here, in the Varnashram system. Now, Prabhupada here is talking about the sannyasis and people that are qualified to take sannyas, because in this particular juncture in the movement, Prabhupada has experienced that there have been many sannyasis who have uh, left the sannyas order of life. Uh, the reason Prabhupada, let's go back a little bit, but the reason Prabhupada gave people or many young people sannyas, was that it was an emergency situation. Just like in the old west in America, uh, you have something called a deputy sheriff. Anyone's heard of that before? Deputy sheriff. That deputy sheriff means not actually a sheriff, at least in the movies, you know, the movies that we used to watch about the cowboys and American Indians. <laughs> cowboys and red Indians, it's interesting when Columbus came to America, 
he thought he'd come to India, and he said, well, these Indians are red. So it was red Indians. So anyway, so, so in the movies we used to watch, uh, there was a, a scarcity of trained up law enforcement personnel. And what happened is that uh, in order to uh, enforce the law, that certain personalities who were not trained up had to be uh, given a badge and said, you're a, a deputy sheriff. That's what deputy sheriff meant. In other words, they were deputizing them in spite of not being qualified because there was an emergency. And Prabhupada understood this. Prabhupada came to the Western world in 1965 and left this world in 1977. And basically, there were about 11 years of really active preaching in the interim. And Prabhupada understood that it was an emergency situation. If he did not open up a certain amount of temples, make a certain amount of devotees, spread the movement all over the world, within 11 years, it wasn't going to happen. And Prabhupada understood this. So therefore, in order to accomplish that, he gave people sannyas that were not really qualified so that they could do it. And they did so much service, and Prabhupada, uh, being very merciful, accepted them even when they happened to change their ashrams later on. So, but that's a short-term arrangement. In the long term, and we're not going to talk specifically about sannyas, one has to uh, proceed in what we call the slow and steady pace in devotional service. Slow and steady pace, I'm mentioning in relationship to the story we all heard when we were young of the uh, tortoise and the hare. Hare means rabbit, and that's something that you have on the head. There's a tortoise and a hare. So, uh, just to remind you all of this story, is once upon a time, uh, there was a marathon, or race, as we used to call it. Nowadays they have marathons, you know, the Boston Marathon. And I'm sure you have a marathon here in Denver, right? And there's different, uh, there's different categories of people who run the marathon. Even I was just uh, talking to one of my disciples who's a marathon runner, he said, he said, I could run a marathon, I could be in the over 70s category. I probably would. Anyway, so this tortoise and the hare, they were having a race. And uh, they, uh, I guess they uh, shot the gun at the beginning of the race, and the hare ran very fast, very enthusiastically, and he took a rest. He took rest in the middle of the race, and the tortoise just continued at a slow and steady pace. And he won the race. And I think you all know that story. And so the motto is, you know, slow and steady wins the race. In other words, being aware <coughs> of uh, how you can continue in Krishna consciousness year after year. Because Krishna consciousness is not just a, or the uh, process of Krishna consciousness is not just the flesh and the pan. I mean, anybody basically can be enthusiastic for two or three years, at least if you're a little pious. Two or three years and gung-ho, reach real heavy and do everything like that. But to consider uh, the process, executing the process of Krishna consciousness over 50, 60 years, that's the long haul. That really is the long haul. So one has to consider, you know, how can I do this for 50 or 60 years, you know, what is the proper, first of all, what is the proper Varnasham position? Should I be a Brahmachari? Should I be a Rahasta? I'm a sannyas. I mean, in my own case, I took sannyas at a very early age. Here we are talking about sannyas again. And I'm very happy I did it. I mean, it's actually my nature. But actually, when I was 20, I didn't know what my nature was. Basically, when you're 20, your brain isn't even developed, fully developed. Did you know that? The brain doesn't develop fully until you're about 35 years of age. That's why in America, uh, even if one wants to be the President of the United States, you have to be at least 35 years of age. And actually, we find some people who are quite older than that who became President and their brain still hasn't developed. <laughs> <laughs> even at over 70. And he's <laughs> so, anyway. So, uh, 
So in other words, when one is, when one is in the 20s, you really don't know what your propensity is. So how, how do you make choices? In other words, how do you make choices when you're in your 20s? As far as, you know, your ashram or your varna or anything like that. Well, that's why we need the association of devotees. Uh, to help us understand and the guidance and advice of the spiritual master or siksha gurus who uh, engage us. Like Prabhupada said, the gurus, one of the gurus uh, duties is to engage the disciple according to the psychophysical nature. That's very interesting. Physical nature means you know the physical body. Uh, psycho doesn't mean that someone's crazy. Uh, it means psychological, his psychological emotional nature. So we take the guidance from uh, advanced devotees, you know, who, who guide us in doing what will be good for us long-term and devotional service. So that's Varna and Ashram. I mean, Varna is just as important as Ashram. Because if you're not happy uh, doing a certain activity, you're going to be miserable. And then you're going to be looking, like Prabhupada said, if the milk, if a cup of milk is not full, there's going to be room for ink. I mean, obviously, you're not going to put ink in a cup of milk, but there's room for something else. Or like an idle mind is a devil's workshop. So you have to be engaged physically, apart from the ashram situation, in doing something that you really can absorb your mind in. You know, Savai Mana Krishna Padara Vindeo. Something that you really. 10 hours, 12 hours a day, you can just like think of, dream about, plan for. That's varna. So, I mean, let's, let's go through the varna. So let's say you got the brahman. The brahman <coughs> likes to do some, uh, some brahmas. There's actually different types of brahman. There's vipras, I mean, who like to study all day long, of course you shouldn't study all day long, you should preach to. But there's brahmins who like to study a lot, and write literatures, there's brahmanas who like to do the puja on the altar, uh, there's brahmanas who like to preach and bring people to Krishna consciousness, and that's their nature. So uh, under the guidance, we can determine, or someone can help us determine what our nature is, you know, whether we can really be doing something. What I often say is, to understand your nature, you should think of what you can do 12 hours a day without getting bored. You may be able to do a lot of things. I mean, for example, in my own case, I can do a lot of things. I may know, I even know how to fix cars, which is like a shooter occupation. Uh, because I, before I joined the movement, I had a sports car and I used to fix it. So I can fix cars, I can do a lot of different things in different varnas. But if you try to ask me to, if you ask me to fix a car or engage in car repair for more than 15 minutes, I'll go crazy. Because it's just like, it doesn't absorb my mind. I know how to do it, but it doesn't absorb my mind. So, and there are many activities. So then there's the Kshatriya activity, where Kshatriya means someone who likes to, uh, not who likes to fight, but who likes to defend and protect people. Sometimes people think that if they have a propensity, they really like to fight and beat up people. They must be Kshatriyas. And uh, once upon a time, there was a, a lady who uh, had a, a little son, and his son liked to beat up all the other kids. And she said, my son must be a Kshatriya. I said, no, that doesn't mean he's a Kshatriya. He's probably, I didn't say it, because she would have been insulted. But I was thinking, he's probably a Shudra, he likes to beat up all the other kids. Just like uh, the story in the Bhagavatam about uh, Vena, the son of Maharaj Anga. I mean, he liked to beat up all of his friends and kill all of his friends. It doesn't mean he was a Kshatriya. It means he was like a, basically an outcast or, uh, because he had those propensities. <coughs> so someone, someone who likes to manage, likes to manage and control, you know, Ishwara Baba, one of the qualities of Kshatriya, and he can do it all day long. That means he's a Kshatriya, and that's how he should be engaged in devotional service. I mean, for example... And our GBC, and I, you know, this is revealing my mind, uh, we have devotees who really are into management. They, they just thrive on it. So they can go like eight-hour meetings every day. 
And for me, it's like the greatest austerity I've ever done. Whether, and, and other people who, who are in the meetings or guiding the meetings, they come out like super enthusiastic after the meeting, brimming with enthusiasm, rolling in ecstasy after a meeting. And I'm thinking, get me out of here. <laughs> you know, sometimes people ask, you know, why I leave my poor right after the GBC meetings? Because probably because I've been traumatized for the last 10 days. <laughs> you know, when you've been traumatized, you want to get out of a place where you've been traumatized. You know, I love my poor, but... Anyway, so uh, there's different propensities. We have to be able to identify these things. And then, of course, Vaisha, one who likes to make money, one who likes to protect the cows, who really likes it. I mean, I like cows, but I can stay protecting cows all day long. would drive me crazy. doesn't mean I'm a demon. It just means I have a different propensity. That's all. You know, you can't put a square peg in a round hole, a round peg in a square hole. You know, we have a psychophysical propensity. And then, of course, shooter. Shooter means one who likes to assist others, which is not bad. It's actually quite nice. So we shouldn't try to transcend our nature. I mean, sometimes devotees hear the statement, you know, sarva dharma bracha jama become sharam bracha, surrender. You know, just do the needful. And of course, in the short run, yes, an emergency situation, according to Varnashram, you can do the duty of someone else's varna. That's fine. That's fine. It's an emergency. Obviously, if the building was on fire and I had to the ability to put out the fire, you know, without a hose or something, or buckets, like they used to use, I would do it, but I'm not going to become a fireman. Or, uh, I'm just not going to do that. But on emergency, yes. So, uh, so, so anyway, so we shouldn't think long-term, short-term is a different thing, that we can do something different than our nature. And in fact, that's one of the messages in the Bhagavad Gita. And one of the lessons that Krishna was teaching Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita that, that Arjuna wanted to change his varna. You know, Ar Arjuna, because he was thinking passionately of not doing his duty, renouncing his duty, renunciation of the mode of passion <coughs> of Krishna in the Gita, uh, and running away from the battlefield and just like meditating or something like that, he was thinking, you know, let me change my varna. It's too difficult to be a Kshatriya because I have to kill my family members. But Krishna said, by your nature, you're going to be forced to fight. An example of that in Arjuna's history, before the Battle of Kurukshetra, was when Arjuna was meditating to get weapons. He was meditating to get the uh, Pashupatra, uh, Lord Shiva's weapon, the Trishita, you know, the trident. So he was meditating in the forest, and uh, on Lord Shiva actually was chanting Om Namo Shivaya to serve Krishna. And uh, what happened as he was meditating, trying to be a good Brahmin, meditating, a uh, big boar, the boar is a pig, in case you didn't know. It doesn't mean someone who gives a boring class. It's a pig with tusks on it. Uh, I was one time attacked by a boar, so I know what boars are. So it was big, big, big. I was in the South. I was in the Caribbean meditating, <laughs> like Arjuna. I ran away. So, <laughs> but Arjuna had to, Arjuna didn't run away. What he did is he pulled his bow and arrow out, and he shot his arrow at the boar. Okay. At the same time, this hunter. Karata shot an arrow at the boar, too. You know, two arrows hit the boar. And the boar was killed. Okay, the boar was a demon. And so, what happened is that Arjuna said, I hit the boar first. And the hunter said, I hit the boar first. So, what happened is that Arjuna started to have a fight with the hunter. I mean, if it was me, and a hunter killed the boar that was getting ready to attack me. I'd say, thank you very much. I don't care who, hit, who uh, hit the boar first. I mean, who cares? I mean, you tried, you protected me, 
or my hour, your hour, who, who cares about it? But Arjuna, because he's a Kshatriya by nature, he was, it was very important. Because for a Kshatriya, pride is very important, like Krishna says to Arjuna in the Bhagavad Gita. You know, people will make fun of you if you don't fight. For one who's been honored, dishonor is worse than death. That's Kshatriya, right? But for a Brahmin, if he's dishonored, you know, Hare Krishna helps me chant Hare Krishna better. <laughs> right? I mean, like, you have Lord Rishabhadev. Of course, he's an incarnation of Krishna, Rishabhadev. And he took this Jati Yoga process where everybody was throwing things at him and making fun of him, passing air in front of him. And he, he was showing us how to become renounced. <laughs> As a, of course, there's also that statement, he who, he who criticizes me as my friend, he who praises me as my enemy. But Kshatriyas don't think like that. Kshatriyas think he who praises me as my friend, he who criticizes me as my enemy. So anyway, so Arjuna started a fight with this Karata, this hunter, and of course Arjuna lost the fight, and ultimately Arjuna discovered that hunter was Lord Shiva. And Lord Shiva gave him the benediction of getting the Pashupatra Astra. As a result, Lord Shiva was very pleased with that fight. So the, the point I'm making is that Arjuna was not advised by Krishna, nor was it possible for him to change his ashram. It just wasn't possible. Because he had a certain psychophysical nature. Yes, he's a pure devotee. I understand that. Absolutely pure devotee. But he was also acting under yoga maya to show us certain things. And one of the things he was showing us that you should act according to your nature. And Krishna said, uh, even if uh, if one tries to do something uh, not following in nature, he said that's sinful. So anyway, so that's Varnashram. Of course, Lord Chaitanya did reject Varnashram as external, so we're not really going that far. But we can understand the essence of Varnashram, or Varna, the Varna system, is that we should be doing something that we're happy with so day after day, and that's also the same with ashram, the ashram system. We should be in a situation so we're happy. Prabhupada said to a temple president one time, your business is to make sure the devotees are jolly. Jolly means not just happy. Jolly means extremely happy, a superlative basically. Extremely happy, and Prabhupada said two things, jolly and eating enough prasad. <laughs> two things. So. So that's really the point. And that's not only in reference to Temple President, that's in reference to anybody who guides devotees in devotional service. That we should make sure that devotees are happy. In fact, our motto, our, uh, our strategic mission statement or vision in Krishna, not just more devotees, happier devotees. And that's, that means devotees doing what they like to do for Krishna. And that's what will make our movement successful. In the beginning, yes, we all did things, I mean, and, I, and we all did things and executed austerities and did so many things. I mean, I could tell you about my past that really were difficult. They really were difficult. Nowadays, of course, even the traveling Sankirtan devotees have it much easier than we had in the early days. In the early days, I remember traveling on Sankirtan, this is something you may be interested in. Uh, we traveled in a Volkswagen Bug. I don't know if you know what a Volkswagen Bug is. And this is our traveling Sankirtan vehicle. And we slept in the Volkswagen Bug. And because I was the junior devotee in our party, I had to sleep in the front with the gear shift between my legs. Anyway. So, so, you know, we do austerities, and, and I don't know if I could do those austerities today, and most of you don't have to do that sort of austerities. Nowadays, for example, we have a, there's a traveling party who was just visiting our temple in North Carolina, they have this nice big Mercedes van, you know, Mercedes van with a heater inside. We didn't have heaters. I mean, we basically, when we traveled, we had to, uh, we used jugs of water that were half iced up to take a bath in the morning. I mean, that was our austerity. And in order to just like stay warm enough to distribute Srila Prabhupada's books in Chicago in the middle of the winter, and Chicago's real cold, colder than here, uh, we have to eat sticks of butter. 
like bananas, just to stay, just to stay warm up. Anyway, so long, short term, it was fun. It was a lot of fun. But long term, we realized we need more facilities. And not only more facilities uh, in terms of physical facilities, but we need to recognize whatever ashram we're in, if we're in the right ashram, we need to recognize that we have certain basic needs. And I'm going to read something from Bhaktivedanta Thakur, who mentions this. And by needs, I'm uh, indicating something different than desires. You know, desires are unlimited. I mean, I'll give you an example myself. Okay. So, uh, in my uh, service, I have a need for transportation. You know, transportation, airplanes, and also I have a car too. So, all right, so I have a, I have a car. Uh, that's a need. Of course, it's not a basic human need, but it's a need for carrying out efficient service. But I'm just differentiating between needs and desires. But if it's a question of desires, I would want a Tesla. You know what Tesla is? But instead, just to fulfill my basic needs, I have a Prius, you know, a cheap, economical car. So, so the desire, you know, or even a Tesla would be enough. I'd probably want a Maserati or a uh, Rolls Royce or something. Imagine going to visit people's homes in Rolls Royce. So, the, you know, like Krishna says in the Gita, Avritam Gami Tena Gami No Nichabayana Kamarupena Kunti Atusprayana Lena Cha. One, one's desires are never satisfied. So we're not talking about desires here. We're talking about needs. Either needs for serving Krishna or basic human needs that everybody has. And here Bhaktivinoda Thakur uh, talks about this. Actually, this is quote from Prabhupada right here. This is the quote from Bhaktivinoda Thakur. This is from the Bhakti Loka of Bhaktivinoda Thakur. Hmm. Uh, from all these conclusions of Srimad Bhagavatam, which we understood that performing devotional service to Srihari is the only purpose of life, there is no other purpose. Unless one makes the gross and subtle bodies favorable for devotional service, one cannot engage in such. That refers, of course, to Varnashram and also our basic human needs that everybody has. There are basic human needs that everybody has regardless of your ashram. And here Bhaktivinoda Thakur continues, there is a need for some arrangements in order to attain a favorable condition in the two bodies. Two bodies means gross and subtle bodies. Subtle body is also a material body. And gross body is obviously a material body. This gross means earth, water, fire, air, ether. And subtle means mind, intelligence, ego. Unfortunately, false ego in our case. So, uh, so one has to make arrangement. There's, unless one makes the subtle bodies and gross bodies favorable for devotion, one cannot engage in such. This, there is a need for arrangements in order to attain a favorable condition in those two bodies. First, in order to maintain the gross body, there is a need to accumulate, and this, this of course, not in every circumstance, to accumulate a house, household items, grains, and drinks. Drinks, nectar drinks. For the prosperity of the subtle body, one needs proper knowledge and proper occupation, which we mentioned before. In order to make the bodies completely favorable for devotional service, there is a need to situate them above the modes of nature. Through the results of fruit of activities from time immemorial, whatever nature and desires a living entity develops is certainly a mixture of goodness, passion, and ignorance. By first enriching the mode of goodness, one should diminish and defeat passion and ignorance and make goodness prominent. When the mode of goodness is completely under the control of devotional service, then it becomes nirguna. By following this gradual process, one's body, mind, and environment become fit for devotional service. So now we're going to talk a little bit about needs differentiating them from uh, desire. So uh, the, the main thing that Bhaktivinoda Thakur is pointing out here, in addition to 
point out that we need to make the subtle and gross bodies favorable for devotional service is that we need to find strategies <coughs> in doing that that are in the mode of goodness. Okay, so let's go over what basic needs everybody has, whether you're a sannyasi, brahmachari, grahasta, manaprasa, sannyasi. Of course, the first basic need everybody has, and I think you all have it, is a need for food, water, you know, protection. You know, that's why we're all wearing caps, or I'm not wearing a cap, or, or uh, coats or things like that. You know, just physical protection, food, water, light, air. Can anyone exist without air? How long can you live without air? About three minutes, five minutes, ten minutes, if you can hold your breath for a little longer. So you, you have a need for these things. This is not simply a desire. Yes, I do desire to breathe. <laughs> I do, I have to admit it. So you have a need for these things. Wow. And also, <clears throat> let's go a little higher than that. I mean, food too. Uh, higher than that, you, you have a... Uh, you have, you have a need for some comfort, you know, which is not like as essential as air or water or light, but you have a need for, you know, having comfortable in the body. I mean, who, who can give a class or speak about Krishna consciousness if you have a terrible toothache? It's very hard. I mean, it's very hard to think about Krishna when you have a toothache. So you need to, you know, have some bodily comfort. And then you also have a need for uh, friendship. You know, I have friendship, which is really important. Uh, friendship and loving relationships. And by loving relationships, we're not speaking about romantic things. Uh, sometimes, it's interesting, sometimes people think, this is also in regard to sannyas and getting married, See, sometimes people think, that uh, because they have a need for friendship, they have to get married. That's not a good reason to get married. Uh, you can also make friendship with the brahmacharis. <laughs> you know, there are other strategies. One has to think very carefully about strategies. I mean, there are reasons to get married, but uh, one should understand the proper needs that need to be fulfilled or the strategies in that particular case. So, uh, you have a need for recreation, which is interesting. I need for fun. I mean, I was told when I, be, when I first joined the Hare Krishna movement, uh, you don't have a need for fun. But anyway, we all <laughs> or no need for recreation or anything like that. So you have a need for recreation. You have a need for fun. You have a need for autonomy. You know, making your own decisions in life. I mean, all these needs have been packaged very nicely by a Western uh, psychologist, Maslow. He uh, came up with this, what's called the hierarchy of needs. And Bhaktivinoda Thakur in his Chaitanya Shikshamrita speaks about this too, about the hierarchy of needs. Hierarchy of needs means the basic needs, it's like a triangle. In the basic needs like food, water, light, which I mentioned before, then it goes up, uh, you know, social interaction, friendship, uh, love, uh, understanding, uh, interdependence, and independence, which is autonomy. Uh, and then ultimately, uh, he describes the topmost peak as being what he says is uh, self-actualization. Self-actualization, we say, is Krishna consciousness. So one has to be able to identify what they need in order to be stable and steady in Krishna consciousness, whether we're talking about ashram, whether you're talking about varna, whether you're talking about uh, how much facility you need, even apart from mushroom and varna, you know, sometimes people may need more uh, warm clothes. <laughs> or they may need uh, other facilities, like in Krishna context, you may need a mobile phone, you may need, you know, I mean, that's not a basic human need, but it's a need for serving Krishna. So you have to be able to identify what these basic needs are and be careful not to let your desires overcome you and think that you have more needs or, or, or your needs go beyond what your basic needs are. Because if your needs go beyond what your basic needs go, are, that's called achihara. 
You know, Rupa Goswami talks about what Atrahara Prayasa Chapa Chapa Niyana Mahagraha, Jana Sambhashta Lalyam Chasa Bhavati Vinashati, that collecting too much or endeavoring too much, Prayasas means endeavoring. So, so, uh, or eating too much like that. So, so one has to understand you know, how much do I need to eat? I mean, this requires some intelligence. You know, how much do I need to eat? And what sort of food? Do I, and you have to apply it through intelligence. Because if you go through desires, you get, you, you're, you'll just overeat. You have to think, you know, what is my basic need? That's what it means to control the senses. What are my basic needs? But don't neglect those needs. If you neglect those needs, then you won't be able to proceed in Krishna consciousness. I'll just tell the story about Lord Buddha. Lord Buddha, uh, after, well, not after he achieved realization, but let's say in the beginning, when he realized the evils of human life, the evils of this material world, birth, death, disease, and old age. He was a, he was a prince Siddhartha before. And his father was trying to protect him uh, from understanding that there was birth, death, disease, and old age in this world. So he kept him very much protected. One day, Lord Buddha went out, and he discovered that there were dead people. There were dead bodies there. There were sick people. There were old people, and there were little babies too, I guess. <laughs> so he discovered the world wasn't uh, what he was taught. It was something different. So then he uh, embarked on his search for self-realization, and one of the first things he did is he executed, started executing real harsh austerities. And as he was executing harsh austerities, he became thinner and thinner and thinner. And eventually, he almost died. And then someone brought him some sweet rice <laughs> from the Hare Krishna temple. <laughs> I don't think it was from the Hare Krishna, but I'm just making that up. Someone brought him some sweet rice, and he took it, and he realized, wow, it's the middle path. Yeah. And Krishna also says that in the Gita. Mitjahara viharasha. One cannot become a yogi if he eats too much, or eats too little, sleeps too much, or sleeps too little. Someone has to be able to identify. And for everyone, it's different. Like if you apply one particular standard for everybody, then it just doesn't work. I mean, for example, like one example of the standard that devotees have tried to apply for everybody in the past is Prabhupada's statement that anyone who sleeps more than six hours a night uh, is under the influence of the mode of ignorance. You've heard this before, I'm sure. So in the beginning days of the movement, that was radically enforced. Nobody was allowed to sleep more than five hours and 59 minutes. You know, if God forbid you wanted to sleep more than that, uh, you got chastised. And of course you always did find a way to sleep more than that when you were driving a car. You know, I remember taking naps at every red light as I was driving and got getting woken up by the car behind me, honking his horn. So, you know, I did make up my sleep in that way. <laughs> or devotees made up their sleep during Bhagavatam class. <laughs> they learned to sleep with their eyes open. <laughs> yeah, that was one of the things we learned in Krishna consciousness, how to keep your eyes open and sleep at the same time. So, yes, I mean, for many people, four hours is enough. For some people, five hours is enough. For some people, six hours. Prabhupada said, <clears throat> one time if you're driving a car, you should try, you can sleep seven or eight hours a night because so many devotees died from car accidents, falling to sleep. We had so many of my God brothers and God sisters die. And when Prabhupada was asked about, and the devotee said to Prabhupada, it was Krishna's mercy, Prabhupada said, no, it was their foolishness. So, you know, when you apply these standards, or let's say the standards of the Acharyas, or even the standards of Prabhupada's diet to everybody, it just doesn't work. Everybody's individual. Everybody's individual. So it requires a great deal of intelligence to go through this list of needs, the list of the varnas, the list of the ashrams, and see, you know, how am I going to be able to continue serving Krishna for the next 70 years, which is what I started talking about before. How am I going to be able to fight Maya? Of course, 
you can't really fight Maya, but Prabhupada was speaking a little poetically there. You know, Maya, please fight. <laughs> uh, Prabhupada actually said when one takes sannyas, it's declaring war on Maya. So, but how am I going to be able to proceed chanting my rounds, following the four regulated principles, waking up early all the time for the next 70 years? Because then you'll achieve a lot more for Krishna than you will by being a, you know, a flaming, a meteor that just flames out or something like that. If you can continue, like the, the tortoise, you know, on the race. So if you can continue serving Krishna year after year, just being very stable, getting enough rest, making arrangement to have friendship and love. You know, everybody has a need for love. Sannyasis have a need for love. You know, I have so many nice relationships with devotees. You know, so I, I admit I have a need for recreation. You know, I exercise every day. Prabhupada exercised every day. Prabhupada spent time, so much time taking care of the body every day. I mean, how many hours a day did Prabhupada get a massage for? I mean, it's amazing. A massage at midday, while his lunch was being cooked by his servant, Sri Tikirti, and a massage in the evening while he was taking rest. He devotee had to climb under the mosquito net and massage Prabhupada for an hour or two. Because Prabhupada had that need, the physical need. He's a pure devotee. I'm not saying that we should all get massages every day. I mean, I don't do it, but you know, Prabhupada had that need. So identify your needs. That's your responsibility. And you know, of course, the responsibility of a mature devotee to help you identify, help facilitate you in identifying those needs. So you can be Krishna conscious your whole lifetime and go back to Godhead. You know, don't be artificial. Uh, an artificial renunciate, either the Varna and Ashram conception. So, anyway, so these are some of the points. It's already nine o'clock. So any questions or comments? Yes? Do, do some of the needs, uh, like you were saying, basically, which mm, most humans? I think everyone has. And then, and then also, wondering, what do you mean, like, that the needs might be a little different according to one's varna? Yeah. Oh, well, not, no, not really. I mean, the needs are basic. It's just the strategies are different. I think, I think everybody has the same need. We're talking about basic needs. Everybody has the same needs. But in different varnas, there's different strategies for fulfilling those needs. And, and you were mentioning that the strategies for fulfilling those needs in each varna, it needs to be done in the most goodness. So what yeah. are you meaning by that? Okay. So like, let's say I have a need to eat. That's in every varna, of course. In every ashram. So obviously I should eat prasana. You know, transcendental prasana. So, so when someone may have have the need, so all right. So, so here's the strategy. So, so let's say someone has the need for, you know, everyone has a need for love, loving relationships, or having a family around them, which is fine. And so, in the uh, grahastha ashram, they would fulfill that according to the regulated principles, which is in the mode of goodness. It's not that they would just like lose control of their senses and. Like, uh, like Prabhupada said that uh, Grahastha Ashram is, is a license uh, for a certain type of sense gratification. However, a license means there's restrictions. Just like if you have a driver's license, it doesn't mean you have an uh, unrestricted driver's license to drive at 95 miles an hour down the, down the highway. And you, know, you have to observe certain principles. So that's what it means to be in the mode of goodness. Whether it's prashadam or in the Grahastha Ashram or in any situation. Uh, I mean, for example, like I have a need for recreation. So what I do is I walk like Robert did. I don't I play soccer, which is probably not the mode of goodness. Uh, I don't, what, what other activities, you know, I don't play golf, which is probably the mode of ignorance. 
It's probably one of, one of the most boring recreational, it's not even a recreational activity, it's probably one of the most boring things you can do. <laughs> like I, one time we were with Prabhupada and driving by a golf course, and Prabhupada said, what is that? And, and the devotee said, it's golf, Prabhupada. And Prabhupada said, what is that? And Prabhupada said, and the devotee said, they take a ball and they hit it and they keep hitting it until it goes into a hole. <laughs> And Prabhupada said they're simply trying to forget Krishna. <laughs> so, I mean, <clears throat> so you have a need for recreation or a need for fun. You know, of course, we have our fun in the kirtans like that. And uh, so th these are all like mode of goodness or transcendental ways of fulfilling our needs. Yes. And like I find myself at times uh, sort of passionate and structured of that nature of control and mm. you know, and then there's a there's self judgment that happens like you shouldn't be like that, you shouldn't be like you know. And and then so how to how to actually still apply one's nature but in a way that's not not Basically, not like yeah, still engaging in Christian consciousness, but in a way that's not perpetuating false ego. Or well, Shatru is definitely an ego. Anyway, uh, that that's an interesting question, and that's why we need the association of devotees. Uh, that's why we have uh, the Varnashram system, so that if we have a Shatru nature, then we need to be associated with Brahmins who can remind us of that. Now, without the association of the Prabhupada, of course, you're all familiar with the example of uh, the many sticks when they're together can't be broken, and one stick can easily be broken. And I'll give you a practical example of my own life when I was young and passionate. Uh, I used to I used to travel by myself doing traveling sankirtan by myself. The reason for that it's not that I was in Maya any more than. So the reason for that was that I was <coughs> doing advanced booking for uh, lectures by Vrita Ananda Maharaj. I was a brahmachari. So my duty was to travel by myself and book at the universities all the lectures. Okay. So it's not that I was doing something independently. So while I was doing that, I distributed books, obviously. I went going out every day and distributing Shri Prabhupada's books. And because I was young and passionate, I began to think that, you know, I'm really great. <laughs> because I didn't have any association, I was just by myself. So I began to think that, you know, I'm so expert, anybody who I want to uh, will take a book. You know, I have, I have Krishna's potency and Krishna's shakti. So basically, after about a month or two of traveling like that, I met up with our main party. And first thing I said to them was, I'm so expert, I can, I can make anybody I want to take a book. You know, imagine the pride that it was in my heart. And so they all started to laugh at me, which was very embarrassing. And I got angry, and I said, watch. And I went out to try to distribute through the Prabhupada's books on the college campus. And nobody would take the book. <laughs> nobody would even give me the time of the day. Nobody would even stop and say Hare Krishna or hello. And Krishna smashed me. So the moral of the story is we need association. And if, especially if we're Kshatriyas by nature. And that's part of our national culture. A Kshatriya is always advised by a Brahma. Otherwise a Kshatriya's nature just like you know, run, he runs away with it because it has control by passion. So that the uh, Varnashram culture means the Brahmins are always the advisors, They're always the facilitators. So that protects us and keeps us in the right consciousness. And that's, yeah, that, that's part of Varnashram.
Yeah, serving. The yeah, we have the Sujas always serving the master and uh, the Vaisha, of course, serving the Brahmins and the cows. So we should identify our varna and not be not be ashamed. You know, I am a Chatri, I am a Vaisha, or just my nature. Just identify it, because Krishna says everybody by doing their prescribed duty can go back to Godhead. Why not? You know, Krishna consciousness is transcendental. There's nothing wrong with being a shudra. It's probably pretty nice to be a shudra, where you get to serve a higher, uh, and, and serve, serve the Vaishnavas. There's nothing wrong. It's actually quite kind of nice. So we should identify our nature and think, you know, we need this association. Good question. Yeah. Thank you. austerity on people, uh, it's like the pendulum. It swings in the other way. They actually revolt in the other direction. And we've seen that with a lot of our uh, gurukulis, you know, the second generation. But now we're probably on the fourth generation <laughs> in the movement. But, but anyway, we saw that with a lot of our gurukulis. And uh, I was one of the teachers, in, uh, one of the first gurukul, the first gurukul. Sorry, I was the second teacher in ISKCON and a Guru Kula, and I had absolutely no training to be a teacher. I was only 21 years old or something like that, and I was dealing with five young boys. And I did not abuse them, but <coughs> it was, actually, it was abusive for me. Because <laughs> I, I, what happened is that they were dropped off by their parents and this was Dallas, Texas. They were dropped off by the parents, and the parents were hundreds or thousands of miles away, and these were five boys that were five years old. And they were crying for their mothers. And basically the philosophy was that actually Ma means Maya. I don't know if you remember that. Ma means Maya, and your real Mother and father, of course, Radharani is your real mother, and Krishna is your real father, your spiritual master is your real father. This is all illusory relationship. Imagine telling that to a five-year-old. And so there was a lot of crying by the children, 
and uh, it was very difficult to deal with the situation. I mean, I, and because I, <coughs> I wasn't allowed to sleep more than six hours a night, I fell asleep while I was teaching the children. The children had to come up to me and shake me to wake me up <laughs> in the middle of the class. <laughs> Teacher, wake up. Teacher, wake up. Anyway, so it was all, all these austerities that we imposed <coughs> also on children, but caused a, a, a reaction. You know, and, you know we, we wonder why so many of our second generation, they just can't you know, wake up early in the morning, for example, or do normal sadhana. <clears throat> it's because they were traumatized. I have one disciple, a very nice devotee in Serbia, and he can't wake up earlier than 8 o'clock in the morning. It's impossible. Why? Because his mother used to, when he was 7 years old, wake him up at 3 and have him do all the puja in the morning you know, seven, eight, nine years old. So right now, you know, early morning is like, you know, PTSD time, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder time. So that's, you know, that, that's a factor that, you know, every action, you know, because there's laws of nature, you Newton, every action, every action is an equal and opposite reaction, or, you know, pendulum swings both ways, or as uh, Karl Marx said, you know, there's a thesis and antithesis. You know, that when you have something that is the opposite, it breeds the opposite, or something extreme. So it's important to, to just do the middle thing all the time. Then you don't have all these reactions. And then, and then people are happy. You know, I, I, I just want to keep devotees in the Krishna consciousness movement. You know, it's, it's easy to make a devotee, but keeping a devotee, it's like keeping a devotee is the mode of goodness. You know, making devotees, we can also say it's transcendental, but there's a little passion in there, too. But keeping devotees and making sure their needs are met is very important part of the, the leadership. Otherwise, like, otherwise, like Prabhupada said, like Alexander the Great, you know, the typical example Prabhupada gave about Alexander the Great, he said, don't make me like Alexander the Great. Alexander the Great would go out and conquer different kingdoms but then he wouldn't take care of the kingdoms he had already conquered, and he would lose them. So Prabhupada said, you know, maintain. At a certain point, Prabhupada even said, you know, let's spoil the milk, or let's, you know, don't make any new devotees. I'm not saying we should do that. But the important thing is, you know, care for the devotees. And care begins at home, too. So you should also care at home and yourself. You know, I, I published one article a number of years ago, uh, that said, you know, you should love yourself. People objected to it. <laughs> yeah, you should love yourself. I mean, Krishna loves you. Why shouldn't you love yourself? I mean, that doesn't mean you love your body and you just decorate your body with it, you know, all the time. But you, but you love yourself, and, and Krishna's, this is an instrument Krishna has given you for serving him. You take care of it. So, any other questions or comments? Sometimes people don't know what's their psychophysical nature. Right. They, they, their whole <coughs> lives they're trying astrology, mentoring this, that. Mm. Even when they're old, they're not quite sure what's their nature. They might be attracted to certain things, the mm. usual things like controlling and so mm. on. You know, like romanticize whatever it is. Um, so I'm thinking like Daiva Varnashram. Mm -hmm. um, this is a way to guide people because we have a material conception mm -hmm. of uh, our nature. And then we're in an environment where, in an institution, where we're called to do the needful and we can discover more of our nature. We're not limited to our material conception of what is our psychophysical nature, right. but we get an opportunity to expand and extend on that. Sometimes we have to do the needful, there's a sense of emergency, and then. Of course. Yes, and in that way we realize, oh, I really like to do this or that, and I can do it for hours, as you were saying. Mm -hmm. So then, Dayan Varasham, it does help us to find out what's our real psychophysical nature, which is to learn to be a servant and be flexible and malleable. 
and that helps us to uh, cope with the vicissitudes of life? Yes, that's true. I mean, we should be ready to do anything that Krishna wants us to do, but <coughs> shouldn't use the word, but uh, at the same time, we have to understand Krishna wants us to be able to be continue year after year in Krishna consciousness. <coughs> so, yeah, you have to balance those two things. I mean, of course, emergency situation, I mean, you ask me to do almost anything, I'll do it. You know, if there wasn't anyone to do the RT, I would run into the RT. If there, you know, your electrical system broke down, I know how to fix it. Of course I would do all those things. But for me to think about doing those things 10 hours a day is not, it's just not going to work. It's just not going to work. You know, I'm not going to be, because the first rule of Krishna consciousness, according to the Acharyas, is to always think of Krishna. And the second rule is to never forget Krishna. So the other rules are actually subservient to that, to those rules. I mean, not that we break the rules, of, you know, not that you start, of course this is Colorado, not that you start smoking marijuana because it helps you remember Krishna more. <laughs> it's legal. So, but you know, within the, within the instructions of Prabhupada, we definitely need to adjust certain aspects of our life to help us remember Krishna more. I mean, we definitely, definitely need to do this on a regular basis. It depends on, um, it also depends on the training we get and our ongoing cultivation of Christian consciousness. And we see that there is a place we can sacrifice and austerity. Of course. Krishna says that it does purify one. So purification will come about and then one will be able to remember Krishna even while one is doing the needful. Yes. Yes, purification will come about if, if, you, remain, if you can remain on the path long enough. The whole point is we're dealing with conditioned souls. I mean, if we're, and we want people to continue on the path. And that's, yeah, obviously, when you're on the path, you're a pure devotee, then forget about everything I said about material needs. <laughs> I mean, you're an absolutely pure devotee. But actually, Arjuna wasn't told to forget everything about his material needs or his material propensities. So I think it, the main thing is to consider what's best for keeping someone in Krishna consciousness. Isn't it? I mean, what's the best thing so that someone can remain their whole life? Because the whole purpose of our movement is to bring and keep people in Krishna consciousness. Not just simply to build big temples, do big projects, but to more devotees, happier devotees, as our motto is. I mean, that, that, that has to be the priority. I mean, I, I'm ready to do everything Krishna wants. That's true. You know, I'm doing austerities. But, not but, <laughs> but negates everything. Uh, and at the same time, I understand I have certain needs. And I make strategies to fulfill those needs because if I don't get adequate food, if I don't get adequate sleep, I'm not going to be able to continue. I mean, it's not that I'll bloop from the Krishna Consciousness Movement, but I'll end up in a hospital. And if I end up in a hospital, I'm not going to be able to do too much service. So, you know, that's a physical need. I mean, for example, uh, years ago I decided to change my diet because I had certain health restrictions or health health challenges and because of that I'm still alive today so if I if I uh, neglected that if I negated that need I wouldn't be here today I'm sure of it so you know I did have to consider certain needs so I can continue serving so it's not it's nothing we neglect these things Yes, we're ready to do whatever Krishna wants, you know, Sarvadharma. But Sarvadharma and Purichaja for Arjuna meant be a, sh be a Kshatriya. It didn't mean be a Brahmin. 
You know, Krishna said, everyone should, this is Krishna's direction, everyone should follow his own nature. What good will repression accomplish? That's Krishna. That's Bhagavad Gita. What good will repression accomplish? Everyone should serve, follow his own nature. And uh, that's my understanding of the teachings of Bhagavad Gita. I'm following my nature. I'm, not, I'm very happy, and I'm serving Krishna. I'm 70 years old, I'm getting close to 70. I'm happy. I'm happy with my varna, happy with my ashram. I'm happy with the service I do. And I do certain austerities, like go to GBC meetings, <laughs> that are not in accordance with my varna, but I do it. Why do I do it? Because I phrase in my mind, I'm choosing to do it, to please Prabhupada. So therefore it becomes, the austerity becomes happy. If I, if I think that I have to do something, then it causes me misery. But if I can phrase it in my mind, I'm choosing, and at, at every moment you are choosing to do things. You always have a choice. If I can phrase in my mind that I'm choosing to do something, like I'm choosing to go to this meeting because this will please Prabhupada, then even when I'm doing something that's not precisely my varna, I'm happy. It is austerity. I tell you, it is austerity for me. I have to be honest. I mean, I can think of a lot of other things I'd rather be doing. <laughs> I'd rather be on the altar of Rinarti. I'd rather be reading Prabhupada's books. I'd rather be on Sankirtan. I'd rather... <laughs> but I'm thinking I'm doing this for Prabhupada. So I, I am doing certain things that transcend my nature, but I'm not doing it 365 days a year, and I'm not doing it, you know, 24 hours a day. I don't think, I just don't think I'd be capable. You know, if someone asked me to attend a GBC meeting 365 days a year, you know, uh, probably be in a mental institution after a while. <laughs> Maybe. Okay, or, or at least playing with my cell phone the whole meeting. You know, reading Prophet's books like under the table. <laughs> all right, I think that's it for today. It's actually we all have a need for prasadam, which I'm interfering with. All glories to Shilaprabhupada. Ah.